Welcome back to the Oscar Project Podcast, the show where I discuss Oscar-nominated films year by year. I am your host, Jonathan Eaterberg, and today I am covering the 1928 film, The Crowd. I'm really glad to be back doing these film-focused shows and would love to have some folks join me to discuss them throughout the rest of this year. If you are interested in coming on as a guest to discuss any of the remaining films from the first Oscars, please find me on social media or leave a comment on this episode in Substack. As always, please be sure to subscribe to the show to get all the latest episodes. So let's jump right into today's film. The crowd first hit theaters on February 28, 1928, in New York City, with wider national distribution on March 3rd. It was directed by prolific director King Vidor, who wrote the story along with Henry Bain, who also helped write our last film, The Racket, though he was not credited on the film. James Murray stars as John Sims, with Eleanor Boardman as his wife Mary, Bert Roach as John's friend Bert, Estelle Clark as Jane, and Daniel G. Tomlinson as Jim. With a running time of 98 minutes, the film was produced by Irving Thalberg and distributed by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, which you might know better as MGM. The film received two Academy Award nominations for Best Director of a Dramatic Picture and Best Unique and Artistic Picture. It was released on VHS and Laserdisc in the past, but does not have a DVD or Blu-ray edition available. However, you can find a copy on the Internet Archive, which is where I watched it. The story of the crowd centers on John Sims and his family as he grows up, faces trials and tribulations, just as any family goes through. His father passes away when John is only 12, but not before telling John that he will be something someday, which becomes a recurring theme throughout the film. It jumps ahead to John at age 21, arriving in New York City to make his big break. He begins working in an office building and meets his friend Bert. After work one day, Bert invites him on a double date to Coney Island. John is paired up with Mary and enjoys her company so much that he proposes by the end of the date. They marry and we begin to see some fractures when John interacts with Mary's mother and brothers at Christmas Eve dinner. It's clear that John is seen as a failure by Mary's family, reinforced by the apartment they live in that has doors and cupboards that won't stay shut and a toilet that's on the fritz. Time passes with John and Mary quarreling periodically, but they patch things up and eventually have a son. A daughter soon follows and John is eventually given an $8 raise. I think that's $8 a week, not $8 an hour. Mary is disappointed, especially since Bert has been soaring up the ranks in the company. But the family gets a big break when John wins $500 for an advertising slogan he writes. Mary is overjoyed and makes out a list of the bills they can pay off while John arrives home with gifts for the whole family. John and Mary call out the window of their apartment to their children, urging them to come home quickly. But when they run across the street, the daughter is hit by a truck and dies later that evening. Both parents are distraught, but John's work is negatively affected by his daughter's death. When he is scolded at work for not performing adequately, he gets angry and quits in a huff. After quitting, John hides the news from Mary briefly, but is forced to tell her when Bert mentions it at a work function the next day. Following his outburst, John manages to land several jobs, but never seems to keep them very long. Mary's brothers begrudgingly decide to offer John a job with their firm, but he refuses, believing it to be a charity job. So he goes out and contemplates suicide, but is followed by his son, who says he wants to be just like his dad when he grows up. That unconditional love changes John's mind, and he soon lands a job carrying a sandwich board. He returns home with renewed hope, but Mary is about to leave with her brothers. She only makes it a step or two out of the house before returning to John inside. John offers her the vaudeville tickets he had bought for the family, but in the final scene, we see all three of them laughing together at the show as the camera zooms out and the Sims family blends in with the rest of the crowd. So looking at some of the key players in the making of this film, the biggest name attached to the film was, and remains to this day, the director, King Vidor. He was born February 8, 1894 in Galveston, Texas, and had a fascination with photography and cameras from an early age, getting started working as an amateur newsreel cameraman at the age of 18. His first film, The Grand Military Parade, was produced in 1913, and he remained a prolific director throughout the rest of the silent era. The Crowd was one of his last silent films before he successfully transitioned to making sound pictures in the 1930s. He spent much of his career working with MGM, and actually worked on the black-and-white sequences for The Wizard of Oz, including Julie Garland's singing of Over the Rainbow. His work on these scenes, as well as other technical work at MGM, often went uncredited. 
Vidor was married three times, first to Florence Arto in 1915, then to Eleanor Boardman in 1926, who he selected to star in the crowd, and finally to Elizabeth Hill in 1932. He had one child with Arto and two with Boardman, the youngest of which just passed away in 2023. Vidor himself lived to the age of 88, passing away on November 1, 1982, at his ranch in Paso Robles, California. James T. Murray was a relatively unknown actor when he starred in The Crowd. He was born on February 9, 1901, in the Bronx, and was the second of seven children. He made his film debut in 1923 as Captain John Alden in The Pilgrims, before moving to Hollywood to pursue his acting career. He spent several years working mainly as an extra on films before he was discovered by Vidor. When asked to interview with the director about the film, Murray skipped the meeting, thinking it was a joke, but was eventually tracked down by Vidor and given the role. Despite the big break of starring in the crowd, Murray soon fell on hard times, even serving time in jail for being drunk during a court appearance. Vidor would attempt to help him once again when he cast Murray in his film Our Daily Bread in 1934. Murray was briefly married to Miss Florida Marion Sayers in 1933. However, he died on July 11, 1936 at the age of 35, drowning in the North River in New York City. Vidor would later write a screenplay titled The Actor about Murray, but it was never produced. Olive Eleanor Boardman was born on August 19, 1898 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She appeared in more than 30 films over a span of 13 years. She married Vidor in 1926 in what was supposed to be a double wedding with actors John Gilbert and Greta Garbo, though Garbo broke off those plans at the last minute. They would remain married until 1933, and as I mentioned a moment ago, had two children together, Antonia and Belinda. Her second husband, Harry Diabdi Derast, was an Argentinian-born French screenwriter and director. Boardman has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, located at 6928 Hollywood Boulevard. She lived to the age of 93 and passed away on December 12, 1991, in Santa Barbara, California. Lastly, Egbert Roach was born on August 21, 1891, in Washington, D.C. He appeared in over 300 films over the course of his career, starting in 1914 and continuing to 1951. And he died on February 16, 1971, in Los Angeles at the age of 79. The crowd took much longer than many other productions around this time, clocking in at 97 days, a time frame usually reserved for more lavish productions like The Mutiny on the Bounty, which would come a few years later. The film was made on location in New York City, much of it with hidden cameras, and employed relatively unknown actors. Despite being a modest success at the box office, it did receive praise from critics. MGM executives found that the bleak social outlook of the crowd was troubling, but the film has since been recognized as one of the masterpieces of the late silent era. The crowd was also among the first 25 films selected for preservation by the National Film Registry in 1989, alongside such classics as Casablanca, Citizen Kane, Vertigo, The Wizard of Oz, and Star Wars. I'll get to my thoughts on the film in just a bit, but the first contemporary review that I came across was scathing in its treatment of the crowd. An unnamed reviewer for Variety published an extremely negative review of the film, beginning by calling it, quote, a drab, actionless story of ungodly length and apparently telling nothing, end quote. The reviewer goes on to complain about both the mundane story and the length multiple times. Given that the film is just over an hour and a half, I would hate to see what the reviewer would have to say about some of our lengthy blockbusters today, like The Avengers Endgame or anything directed by James Cameron in the last 30 years. My thoughts lie much closer to those of the New York Times reviewer Morden Hall, who wrote that the crowd was, quote, a substantial and worthy pictorial feature that is a powerful analysis of a young couple's struggle for existence in this city, end quote. Hall seemed to understand that the film is meant to represent any number of people going through the same life experiences as John and Mary. We are supposed to identify with them, if not in all their experiences, at least in some. Film Daily proclaimed that the film has universal appeal and an intensely human story, when it was released in 1928, and in early 1930 ranked it among 10 best pictures of that year. And finally, Photoplay listed Boardman and Murray among the best performances of the month and called the film, quote, a tremendous production and one that comes as near to reproducing reality as anything you have ever witnessed. Needless to say, the overall consensus of reviews was generally positive. At the Oscars, the crowd was nominated for two Academy Awards, the first was for the one-time-only category Best Unique and Artistic Production, which officially went to producer Irving Thalberg at MGM. In his 2005 book Lion of Hollywood, The Life and Legend of Louis B. Mayer, 
Scott Eyman notes that the crowd was a big departure from the standard fare that was coming out of MGM at the time, but it was greenlit by Thalberg anyway. However, Mayer hated the film and refused to vote for it for Best Picture when the time came for the Academy Awards. Mayer would go on to use the film as a, quote, example of everything that was wrong with artistic filmmaking, end quote. And this may have contributed to the film not winning in this category. In addition to that nomination, King Vidor received a nomination for Best Director of a Dramatic Picture. It's interesting that the film landed Vidor's nomination in the drama category, since there was an award for Best Director of a Comedy Picture at that first Academy Awards. Even though there are comedic elements to the film, it apparently skews a bit too far toward dramatic picture to be considered for the other category. The two directing categories would be combined the following year and remain so until the present day. Vidor would go on to be nominated for a total of five Oscars for Best Director and ultimately receive an honorary Academy Award in 1979. I personally like this film overall. It was something I could identify with quite closely, appreciating the struggles that John and Mary go through over the course of the film things that many young families experience. Everything in it felt real and relevant even today. On a personal note, I most identified with them at the point where their daughter is killed by the truck. I've mentioned in a few of my filmmaker interviews this year that my wife and I lost our first child when he was only a month old. So anytime I see a young child die on screen, I feel that deeply in my core. And I don't want to end this episode on a downer, so I will add that there were a few comparisons I made as I watched. In many aspects, this film reminded me a bit of It's a Wonderful Life, even though it came out nearly 20 years earlier. Murray's portrayal of John Sims has a very Jimmy Stewart quality to it, and this was further reinforced when John considers suicide near the end of the film, just as George Bailey does in It's a Wonderful Life. It's also ironic that both characters are married to a woman named Mary. There were also several moments in the film that made me laugh out loud as I watched. First, when John is working early in the film, there is a cutaway to the clock in the office, and the second it hits five o'clock, every man in the office bolts up from his desk and heads for the door. When they're on the first date at Coney Island, John and Mary ride on a Tunnel of Love style ride, which opens up randomly for onlookers to see if the riders are kissing, under a sign reading, Do They Neck? The entire scene at the apartment before Christmas Eve dinner is played for laughs, with various parts of the home breaking in a very slapstick way. And something that still amazes me is the scene when John rushes to the hospital upon hearing that his son has been born. There are several long benches with men sitting on them, all waiting for their wives and newborns to come out. I know that's how things were done at the time that this film was made, but I just find it funny since I was in the room when all of my children were born. Finally, another sign of a different time is the attire worn by John and Mary on their honeymoon to Niagara Falls, and later when they are on the beach with the kids. They wear what we would probably call business casual, at least, while out by the falls taking pictures. And on the beach later in the film, there are men in suits and hats, something you'd never find today unless it was for some sort of fashion magazine photo shoot. As always with my individual movie episodes, I'll include a list of references in the show notes, including where you can find the film to watch online. Please be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe to the Oscar Project newsletter at theoscarproject.substack.com. The Oscar Project podcast is written and produced by me, Jonathan Etreberg, with editing assistance from Joshua Etreberg. Join me for my next movie episode where I discuss the film Sadie Thompson. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you at the movies.